Great paintings deserve great viewers, but it's not always easy to connect the two. Arguably, the greatest intermediator of the first half of the 20th century was Ambroise Vollard, a patron, dealer, and publisher. He brought the gospel of modern art to Paris and beyond. Consider a list of a few artists he promoted. Bonnard, Cézanne, Degas, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Matisse, Picasso, and Vuillard. Curator Gary Tintero talks to Canapé about the exhibit Cézanne to Picasso, Ambroise Vollard, patron of the avant-garde, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Ambroise Vollard was the most important art dealer of the 20th century. It's really impossible to overestimate his contribution to the development of modernism. He gave so many artists who were household names today their very first exhibitions. Picasso, Matisse, Dorin, Vuillard, Bonnard. He promoted at the end of their lives the career of the great Impressionists, Degas and Renoir. He gave the materials to Mayol to be a sculptor. He got Renoir to make sculptures, which he never would have done. He cast Picasso's first sculptures. He disseminated Picasso's prints. He turned Vuillard Bonnard into the master lithographers that they became. He made some of the most beautiful and important illustrated books of the 20th century. So you can't exaggerate his contribution. He gave, uh, you know, Cezanne his first exhibition in Paris, his first solo exhibition, and it was a sensation. A new generation discovered his work. The symbolist critics wrote about him admirably. Artists like Monet and Renoir and Degas came in and bought his works from Vollard. And that, that started Vollard's art dealing in earnest, but it also rediscovered Cezanne for his generation, the younger generation, and it really propelled the development of modern art in the early 20th century because these younger artists looking at Cezanne took aspects of his work and then created something new with it. There are really three big rooms uh, in the exhibition, Cezanne, Gauguin, and Picasso, because in a way he had the greatest impact on those three artists. Vollard's relations with Gauguin were the opposite of Cezanne. Cezanne could not have been more pleased with, his, uh, with Vollard's activities on his behalf exact opposite with Gauguin. Gauguin was never happy, never enough. Cezanne was happy for 200 francs for a painting. Gauguin wanted 600 francs. Things turned around finally in 1898 when Vollard gave a one-man show to Gauguin that again was a sensation with a small world of critics. And the centerpiece of it was this great masterpiece, Du Venon Nu, Where Are We Come From? Who Are We? Where Are We Going? Which is his largest canvas, a kind of uh, manifesto of his artistic beliefs. It's a fusion of Christian symbolism and Tahitian symbolism uh, with uh, everything from a young child, an infant, to an old woman about to face her imminent death. And uh, Gauguin worked so hard on this painting and it was a culmination of so many thoughts and desires, ambitions on his part that he thought he was going to commit suicide after he created this work. The final big room in the exhibition is for Picasso. And for Picasso, although they never had a re an exclusive relationship, Vollard was the only dealer until the First World War who bought regularly from Picasso. 1906, 1907, 1908. Uh, we knew that in uh, one of the two exhibitions, um, I think 1895 and 98, that Vollard had mounted a Van Gogh's work, that uh, there um, was a triptych installed. Three views of Paris, each uh, with a red border. All of Van Gogh's pictures went to the widow, Johanna Bonger Van Gogh, and uh, she consigned a number of works to Vollard. Vollard also, through a runner, was able to obtain works that Van Gogh had painted down in Arles, like the famous La Berceuse, Madame Roulin, the beautiful portrait of their son, Armand Roulin, uh, Dr. Felix Gray, who was the doctor who cared for Van Gogh after he had uh, mutilated his ear, and Volar after the F First World War and after Van Gogh's prices began to uh, really hit the roof, he regretted that he hadn't bought the works from the widow, that he had taken them in on consignment, and that he himself had bought very few works. He saw that Van Gogh was the train that he had missed. There are marvelous portraits here. Uh, there's an octagon in the exhibition of these great portraits of Volar. As Picasso said, the most beautiful woman in the history of art had never had her portrait painted as many times as Vollard, who was hardly a beautiful uh, individual. He was a big bear of a man, 
uh, gruffly handsome. I think that uh, the Picasso portrait behind me here is, in a way, the most telling of all the portraits. Uh, you get a strong sense of his swarthy complexion. He often sat with a cat, and in the many portraits here by Bonnard, he's, he's seated with a cat. It's easy to know which cat it is because all of his cats were named Amboise after himself. I think that uh, Volar understood what a contribution he had made. Um, in, a f in a strange way, for a public figure, he was very, very private. His great pleasure was in making these illustrated books. Uh, he had many works of art still in his custody. This was the stock of his gallery. He hadn't, his gallery really closed after the f First World War and never really opened again. It was his activities as a writer, as a publisher of illustrated books, and a publisher of bronzes that he really uh, continue to, to act in the 1920s and 30s. Let them eat cake, so said Marie Antoinette, who thereby earned herself a place in quotable history. It also put her in line for the guillotine at the height of the French Revolution. Her life certainly never lacked drama or luxury, or just about anything else. It's the stuff of movies, and that's what it has become. The acclaimed director of Lost in Translation, Sofia Coppola, goes where no camera has gone before to tell Marie's tale. The director and her star, Kirsten Dunst, give Canapé a preview. Our film on the internet uh, shows her life from when she arrives in Versailles when she's 14 years old and, and how she kind of grows up in this situation becoming the Queen of France and, and ultimately is taken away at the Revolution and I think it, it it's, it's, a, it's a personal, uh, I tried to make it a personal portrait from her point of view of what it might have been like. This particular version of Marie Antoinette, candy is a, is, a, is a good way to describe it, sexy candy. This is ridiculous. This, madame, is Versailles. It was unbelievable because Versailles is you know, that was a character in itself. It's, and to be able to shoot where they really, you know, got married, where she really performed on her little stage and in her mini opera house. And to be in those places and, you know, you, you touch the fabric and you're like, oh, I wonder if they looked out this window and touched this fabric. <laughs> I read different things, but, but my, I decided to base my script from Antonia Fraser's biography. And, but there was so much in the book, I, I, um, I used it as a starting place, and then I tried to imagine what it might have been like and what they might have talked about based on, on what, I, what I read from, from her research. And then also there were books by different people of the court of that time. And there were letters from Marie Antoinette to her mother describing her daily life at Marie Antoinette. And she spoke about how she wakes up before the whole world every morning and, and the whole court comes and watches her to wash her face. And then she goes to mass and it sounded like this routine that, so we tried to show that in the film with these montages. Um, we're making a movie about Marie Antoinette, so I thought we needed lots of silk and macaroons. And, um, and I asked Milena to make uh, the whole palette of the film I wanted to be um, in the macaroon colors for the young part of her life. And um, when I visited the real private apartments of Marie Antoinette, they had the fabrics that she liked, which were turquoise and pink, and I thought to make the film from her point of view and, and, and have it feel very hopefully vital and fresh and not looking at history from a distance. A lot of times you see co the, the clothes or the paintings over the years have, um, you know, have faded and, and we wanted to not look from a distance but go back and have something that was fresh in this young girl and, 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 um, and in that palette.
people of France are hungry. Letting everyone down would be my greatest unhappiness. There's a mob of hundreds on their way. Lance Armstrong put the Tour de France on the American map. His accomplishments opened a door to the world of competitive bicycle racing. But all of this is no surprise to the French, for whom the race has been an annual event since 1903. Indeed, in his new book, Tour de France, A Cultural History, Christopher S. Thompson examines how the race mirrors the many changes in 20th century France. Canapé signs up for a tour with the author. I was interested in exploring this French institution as a way of understanding uh, a whole range of stories the French have told to themselves over the last century about their 20th century experience. The itinerary of the Tour de France uh, reflected all of uh, French diversity, all the different regions, the different accents, the different uh, uh, dishes that were from each uh, town and city, uh, the different traditions, the different dialects, that all this rich diversity of France was still French. It was something to be celebrated as uh, a factor in the, the unity of the French people. Um, that was the, the take of the organizing newspaper, uh, which was a sports daily called Loto. As the race went through region after region, Loto uh, conveyed the basic stereotypes of the Breton as very religious and stubborn, of uh, the French of uh, the Midi of, of southern France, very exuberant and noisy and joyful. Uh, a whole range of images that kind of reinforced um, stereotypes that the French were already forming about um, uh, different populations uh, within their borders. All the racers, or almost all the racers, um, after the first few years of the race, came from uh, the working poor, uh, usually uh, the urban um, working class uh, in Paris, but also some of the other larger cities of France. The racers were behaving in ways that offended middle class spectators in the cities and towns uh, through which the race uh, traveled. They were urinating on the side of the road in front of uh, bourgeois women. They were stealing drinks and food from cafe tables as they raced by. They were beating up on each other. They were swearing at race officials. They were conducting themselves in a very unrespectable way. And as a result, to respond to this criticism, the organizing newspaper uh, created this image of the Tour de France racers as what they called ouvriers de la pédale, pedal workers and presented them as model uh, laborers, that they represented both the great artisanal tradition of French guilds, uh, as well as very disciplined modern factory workers. Commentators uh, have described, since its, its very first running in 1903, have described the Tour de France as an inhuman event, and even many of the racers themselves over the decades have used that word, that, they, that superhuman efforts were required of human beings and that's what rendered the Tour de France inhuman. And it is true that, uh, particularly in the early decades of the race, they uh, were cycling over terrible roads, uh, the stages were much longer, they didn't have the benefit of the support staff that the modern racers would have, particularly after World War II. Um, what's very interesting about this sort of what I call the cult of suffering and survival, this emphasis on the attrition rate as being a kind of marker of how great a sporting event the Tour de France is, is that it's not just something that goes back to pre-World War II days. It has remained the foundation of the race's appeal for many fans and uh, a foundation of the race's sort of heroic mythology. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, actually the first Tour de France in 1903 was partly motivated by the desire of the organizing newspaper, the Sports Daily, uh, whose main investors were automobile and bicycle manufacturers, and their motivation was let's create a race that exposes communities around France who have not yet uh, become aware of the advantages of the bicycle to the bicycle, to this extraordinarily relatively recent uh, invention that at that time was seen as very modern. The Tour de France innovated in the areas of commercial sponsorship of sport, with what is called the caravan publicitaire, the publicity caravan in the 1930s. That said, I should point out that the technology of the bicycle has um, gone through a series of revolutions since, I'd say, about the early 1980s. Uh, and, and the bicycles that the racers use are now 
almost unrecognizable uh, when compared to the bicycles of the 1970s. The materials have changed, the designs have changed, um, and as a result, uh, the racers are ever more efficient on their bicycles. The greatest challenge facing the Tour de France and cycling in general, general and in fact, uh, sport in general, uh, is doping today. I think that's very clear. The scandals are just uh, succeeding each other at such a rapid pace, and particularly in the sport of cycling, which has a long history of doping extending back to the late 1800s and the very early days of the sport. Um, people are really beginning to seriously pose the question as to whether, if these doping scandals continue much longer, um, the sport and the Tour in particular, its, its most important event, are in jeopardy of uh, being extinguished, that the public will become cynical, that commercial sponsors will flee the Tour because as their stars get mired in doping scandals, the, the positive publicity they were hoping to get from those stars uh, obviously uh, disappears. It's up to the public to decide ultimately. And so far, I would say that the public doesn't seem to be terribly troubled by admissions of doping. Um, polling data suggests that in Europe they associate cycling with doping, but they, the evidence of all these crowds on the side of the tool year after year, despite the doping scandals, suggests that the public has a rather high threshold of tolerance for doping scandals. So if the public continues to tolerate the practice of doping, uh, it may be that commercial sponsors still see the tool as a viable uh, publicity um, uh, strategy and that the race will survive. But if governments continue to come down hard on the Tour and on cyclists in general, that may prove very dangerous for, for the Tour. Bilingual authors bring a special accent to their fictional worlds. One need only think of the special universes created by Samuel Beckett and Vladimir Nabokov. A new candidate for that list is Shan Sa, already winner of multiple literary prizes. Born in Beijing in 1972, she moved to Paris in 1990. Her novel, The Girl Who Played Go, written in French, won worldwide acclaim. The gifted painter, as well as writer, chats with Canapé about her new novel, Empress, based upon the life of Empress Wu, China's first female ruler. Empress is um, self-fiction of um, Chinese emperor, the only woman who became in the Chinese history um, an emperor. So as a female ruler of the most important empire and the heaven, she left her uh, village when she was uh, 13 years old and uh, she discovered the forbidden city and uh, which is totally different. It's a huge uh, and, uh, and uh, rich and uh, gold uh, glittering uh, village. And I discovered Paris when I was uh, 17 years old. So I think we have this different, we have this uh, similar life. We have this um, inner passion, the, the will, we're willful women. And uh, we, we want to express ourselves. We want to be accepted by, um, by a foreign world. And we want to uh, change our life into a destiny. So she came to me and, uh, and told me her life. And I share with her um, her lovers, her uh, hate and her her passions, her sadness, and her joys. And also she guided me to the other level that I have never attended. It took me four years to write the book. Everybody shared in China the same documentary. That means nothing, because her memory has been erased by, by man's dominations. And, um, the, the his, historians change her stories. So I can, with that confirmation, I, I allowed myself to, to build um, her, her life with my imagination. With my life, I fueled that um, in love, 
her envelope, her story, with my past and my love stories. When I wrote my first novel, when I finished that, I showed my first novel to my French friends, and they all laughed because it was, it was totally strange. <laughs> it, was not, it's, it was not understandable. You know, our language is so noble, it's so difficult, so elegant, it's impossible to write in French. And that is the word, impos impossible. I, I love impossible thing. That trained me to be very precise and to be very imaginative in, in my writing. And in painting too, when I started to paint was I used the Chinese traditional, um, traditional way. And so I realized that oil painting is uh, a new performance and also a new discovery of my, of my, uh, myself. Who am I? Um, where I come from? And um, where I'm going? So I, so I continue in this way, and I, I really, I enjoy a lot to, to be capable to transform, discover myself at age of uh, 30. It's hard to imagine, but once there was a world without DVDs, cassettes, cable television, and telephones that show movies. But that's not to say the world lacked movie lovers, folks who were confident that the cinema was something more than just a way to waste a few hours. One of the great institutions to grow out of that cinephilia is the Cinémathèque Française, now housed in a beautiful Frank Gehry design building in Paris. Director of the Cinémathèque, Serge Dubiana, seats Canapé for a matinee performance. La Cinémathèque française a été fondée par Henri Langlois en 1936. Donc cette année, nous fêtons le 70e anniversaire de la Cinémathèque. Et la Cinémathèque française est née en même temps, pratiquement, que la Cinémathèque du MoMA à New York, Museum of Modern Art. C'est-à-dire à une époque où un certain nombre de personnalités étaient extrêmement soucieuses, préoccupées par le fait que le cinéma muet allait disparaître. Parce que jusqu'à une certaine époque, les films, une fois qu'ils avaient vécu, qu'ils avaient eu leur sortie commerciale, étaient mis dans les caves, dans les, dans les, dans les stocks, dans les... Euh, parce qu'il n'avait plus de deuxième usage. Il n'y avait pas la télévision, il n'y avait pas le DVD, il n'y avait pas la vidéo, il n'y avait pas le satellite. Bon. Et l'institution a continué d'exister, un peu avec des, une histoire très mouvementée, parce que c'est une association privée, de, 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 dont la, la base est, est constituée par les membres qui adhèrent à cette association, qui donnent à cette association soit des films, soit des objets, des costumes, des appareils, des décors, des scénarios, des, des affiches. Donc c'est une association qui, depuis 70 ans, vit comme une institution privée et qui est financée par l'État, par l'argent public. L'année dernière, en 2005, nous sommes, nous nous sommes installés ici, dans ce bâtiment, construit par Franck Guéry, euh, qui a une dizaine, euh, au début des années 90, et qui a été au départ l'ancien American Center. Donc la Cinémathèque, depuis euh, quelques mois, on a ouvert fin septembre 2005, nous sommes dans ce bâtiment qui est beaucoup plus moderne, avec trois salles pour le public. Jamais la Cinémathèque n'a eu trois salles dans le même bâtiment, plus une quatrième salle pour les enfants, les, les classes d'école, les scolaires, et, et plus des espaces pour les expositions permanentes, temporaires. Euh, donc on a vraiment pour la première fois dans l'histoire de la Cinémathèque, un lieu plus propice, plus permettant de développer plus d'activités. L'Anglois a toujours pensé, et ça c'est un, un, un élément très important, qu'il ne, enfin, il ne, il ne fallait sauvegarder les films qu'en les montrant au public. Donc il faut à la fois protéger et montrer. Donc la, la double activité de la Cinémathèque, principalement, c'est cela, c'est de garder les films 
et ces films sont gardés dans la banlieue parisienne, dans un fort à Saint-Cyr, qui fait qu'on a 40 000 films gardés, stockés, sauvegardés, protégés dans nos archives. Mais l'activité essentielle, c'est de programmer des films, donc d'avoir une programmation, de raconter l'histoire du cinéma à travers les auteurs, les producteurs, les pays, etc. Et la vocation de la Cinémathèque depuis l'origine, c'est une vocation internationale. C'est-à-dire que tout de suite, l'Anglois s'est intéressé au cinéma suédois, au cinéma japonais, au cinéma américain, au cinéma, au cinéma d'où qu'il vienne. Et donc ça, c'est une vocation très importante en France, de rendre hommage aussi bien à, là, à Rossellini, on a fait Jean Renoir, on a fait David Cronenberg récemment, on va faire Anthony Mann là, bientôt, on fait Isabelle Huppert actuellement, d'avoir une, une vision très très large. Je crois qu'aujourd'hui les gens se posent la question, à quoi ça sert la cinémathèque, une cinémathèque Parce que on arrive à l'ère le numérique, il y a beaucoup de télévision qui, qui montre énormément de films anciens, en noir et blanc, des films du répertoire, il y a le DVD, tout le monde achète des DVD chez soi, etc. Alors les gens me disent, mais à quoi ça sert une cinémathèque est-ce que ce n'est pas la mort des cinémathèques Est-ce que ce n'est pas la fin des cinémathèques Et moi je réponds non, au contraire. Plus on a des films en DVD, plus on a des films sur l'ordinateur, plus on a besoin d'avoir des lieux de référence. Des lieux où on peut découvrir une certaine histoire cohérente du cinéma, avec des intégrales, avec un, un lieu qui, comment dire, qui donne une légitimité à cette culture du cinéma. Vous comprenez Parce que plus on a accès au film aujourd'hui, moins on a une vision globale de l'histoire du cinéma. Or, c'est ça qui manque terriblement. 